On today's brand new episode of Oklahoma Gardening, we are getting things ready for spring. Kim cleans up our birdhouses to prepare for new nests and looks at how plants respond to different types of pruning. Barbara Brown prepares ambrosia and Kim is in the greenhouse to pot up vegetable seedlings and start some herbs from seed. Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance is provided by TLC, Oklahoma's leading garden center, Southwood Landscape and Nursery, Tulsa's source for great gardens, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Cleaning our birdhouses out to prepare them for the spring nesting season. Cleaning your birdhouse at least once a year is a good idea to ensure the health of our feathered friends. Um, one of the most important things we want to do is remove any traces of disease agents that might be in there. So cleaning reduces the risk of insects, feather mites, bacteria, and fungus that can spread disease to our birds. It also makes the birdhouse more attractive to birds returning to the area, and they're more likely to use a clean house over a dirty one. So before we get started, it's a good idea to wear a mask uh, just to protect yourself against any mites or other pathogens that are in there. And I'm gonna be using bleach, so I wanna wear some gloves. So open your house and look for a nest. Some houses might still have a nest in them. Uh, this one doesn't have a nest, but there is some feces in there. And when you're removing either a nest or the feces, you wanna dispose of it in a plastic bag. And so I'm just going to scrape as best I can some of the loose material into the bag. And again, if you have a nest, go ahead and put it in a bag in the garbage. Don't throw it in the compost pile because you wanna get rid of any disease agents that might be in there. All right, here's some on the lid too. So check all the surfaces. We want to clean all surfaces, uh, the door, the back wall, the side walls. Um, you might even be able to spray up in there. Oh, a wasp nest is a deterrent against housing birds. So if you see that inside, go ahead and get rid of that as well. Okay, and then we're going to just scrub the surfaces and overall disinfect our birdhouse. Now, when we're working with bleach, it's a good disinfectant. Um, and one of the advantages of bleach is that it, it volatilizes into the air very quickly. So when we're finished cleaning, we let the birdhouse thoroughly dry. We're not gonna be worried about any remaining uh, chemical in the birdhouse, because it's just gonna volatilize into the air and leave that birdhouse clean and disinfected and chemical free. I have a lot of loose material in here. I'm gonna get a bucket of water just to clean that out and using a rag, go ahead and try to wash as much of this material out. Clean up the birdhouse. One of the areas to pay attention as you clean are along the edges. So there's several vent spaces in the birdhouse. We have along these edges and up at the top, that allows airflow. And then at the very back from the bottom going in is a vent space that you also want to make sure is clean of debris. That's very important to allow good air circulation in our birdhouse, uh, which helps keep it cool in the summertime. So 
check that as you're working. And make sure to thoroughly rinse as much of that bleach out of here as you can. And then we want to leave this open for uh, several hours to dry out and that'll help the bleach volatilize. This is a good time to inspect the birdhouse for any repairs that it might need. Maybe the roof has come loose or we have a screw on the side here that can use tightening. So this is a good time to just go through, do some basic maintenance. When the birdhouse has dried, we could come back and close it up and it'll be ready for a new bird family to come and nest inside. While your birdhouse is drying, this is a great time to inspect the area around it. For example, if the house is on a post, uh, there might be bird droppings on the post or here on our trellis. So great time to clean that up as well, just to keep the entire area disinfected. Now, February each year, there is the Great Backyard Bird Count. This is a citizen science project started by the Audubon Society and Cornell's Ornithology Lab. And it's a time for every person in the country or around the world to help collect data about wild bird populations. And the way it works is during the weekend, it's a four day event, if you spend just 15 minutes counting the numbers and types of birds that you see and you enter that data online. And that helps scientists collect vast amounts of data that otherwise could not be collected by even a big team of scientists and helps us understand better the distribution and populations of birds. So log on to the Great Backyard Bird Count and be part of this wonderful citizen science project. Late winter is the time of year to prune our woody shrubs and trees, but many gardeners approach pruning with a little bit of hesitation. So today we're going to look at how plants respond to pruning and different types of cuts to hopefully take a little bit of that anxiety away. So there's three main different cuts that we're going to talk about, which are pinching, heading, and thinning. So let's start with actually some herbaceous plants when we talk about pinching. And pinching is the removal of the very tip of the plant, the growing point. And it's called pinching because we don't use tools for this. We just use our fingers to remove the material. And what is happening here is the growing point, the plant material produces a hormone called auxin. And this chemical prevents any of these buds lower down the stem from opening up and growing. And so when we remove that, we reduce the amount of auxin flowing down the stem, which allows buds lower down to open up and grow. And any branches lower down to grow more so than they would with the control of that tip. And so what we find is when we tip a plant, we go from something that's rather leggy to a much more full plant, like we have with the copper plant or the coleus here. And so it's a way to form plant growth. Now there are applications on woody plants, particularly with young shrubs. Uh, we would go ahead and pinch that growing tip again, which will cause the buds down here to open up. And then in our pines and other needled evergreens, the way we control growth in the spring is by pinching the new candles or the new growth to reduce the growth. Now let's look at another form of pruning. A heading cut is similar to a pinching cut, but we're removing more plant material. And what a heading cut is, is cutting back stems by varying degrees. And in general, the farther you cut a stem back, the stronger the regrowth response will be to that. Also, the more vigorous the stem is that you cut, the more vigorous the response. And one of the applications we use with a heading cut is for shaping a shrub or a tree. And we can see here, this is a nine bark and there's two more adjacent to it, which have a very full branching habit, but this one is a little lopsided. So I am cutting this large branch back pretty far down. I want to encourage a strong response of branching from the buds down here. And that'll help fill in this side of the shrub and improve the overall shape. Another application of heading cuts is with newly planted trees and shrubs. 
We can see a nice example with our button bush. This plant did not receive a heading cut early in its development, and it's grown with a single branch or trunk, whereas the other button bushes were cut back early on in development, and so they have a more branched habit. And so this is a nice way to visualize the plant and how it responds to that type of cut. A very drastic example of the use of heading cuts is in fruit trees, as you can see with the strong branching patterns in an orchard. Now sometimes gardeners are very surprised at the strong response of a plant to pruning. When they come in thinking they're controlling the plant size and it responds with vigorous growth, the problem is that a heading cut was used instead of a thinning cut. So let's look at one last cut that's the best technique to reduce size and control growth. A thinning cut removes a branch at its point of origin where it intersects with another branch or the trunk of a tree. And there's very little response in terms of growth from this type of cut. So we don't stimulate a large amount of regrowth. And so just an example coming in and cutting at that intersection. Now sometimes this might mean way down at the bottom of a plant. This type of cut is the best way to maintain the natural form of the plant while reducing the overall size. Hopefully these tips will help you better understand how plants respond to pruning and selecting the most appropriate type of cut. When I was a kid, ambrosia was one of my favorite things to eat, and I don't know still to this day whether it's simply because the word is so romantic or, or whether it was simply because it's so good, probably a combination. But this is what we're doing today, and m when I was a kid, we used a lot of canned fruit, and you can still do that. I'm going to do uh, fresh fruit with this one, however, so I've got one and a half cups of fresh pineapple. Now again, canned pineapple will work just as well. Uh, it tastes a little bit different because the fresh is not cooked and the canned obviously is during the canning process. If you are using canned, make sure you get the chunks that are canned in juice and save that juice because it's pineapple juice and it's perfectly good to use. So uh, that's gonna go in our, in our bowl, one and a half cups of pineapple. Now the next thing I'm gonna put in here are orange sections. Uh, orange sections uh, back in the day and a lot of folks are still using the canned mandarin oranges. Again, they're fine and if they're in juice, which they should be for this recipe, drain the juice and save it. Mix it with the pineapple juice and, and make a special <coughs> breakfast beverage or something. I sectioned fresh oranges. You could use the small mandarin oranges or the clementines uh, in order to do this as well. Um, just make sure if you're using regular oranges, not the clementines so much, but that you actually do the sectioning so that you get the membranes off. They do have a little bit of bitterness to them, not so much as grapefruit, but the thing that's with these is that they're a little bit tougher and, and we want to get that part away. I've got about a cup and a half. This is about two medium to small bananas I'm going to put in here. Uh, bananas are fairly straightforward. They're always going to be fresh. Uh, and then uh, one and a half cups also of um, uh, seedless grapes. I like the red ones simply because of the color contrast here. If you only have green, you could use that equally well. I've got a half of a cup of miniature marshmallows, and this is going to provide a little bit of sweetness. You do have some tartness going on with some of the other ingredients that are in there. Uh, they also provide a really fun texture. And the next ingredient is yogurt. I'm using a vanilla low-fat yogurt. You could use a Greek yogurt if you chose, and the amount of sugar you're going to use uh, is kind of up to you. If you do use a Greek yogurt and as you're working through it, you decide it's a little bit too tart, you could always add a little bit of sugar or you could add some of the juice that you've drained away from some of the other ingredients as well if you're using canned. This is simply going to get stirred together. Now, for best flavor, it's nice if you give it a couple of hours for those flavors to blend together so it has time for everything to kind of start tasting like it's the same thing. The next ingredient we're going to use, I'm going to sprinkle on the top, but if you wanted to, you could actually sprinkle in here as well, and that's toasted coconut. Now, I'm using a packaged coconut product. I see some recipes out there and maybe you choose to flake your own. That's a little bit more of a challenge than I usually want to go through uh, in order to make a, a dessert or a salad. This is 
used either way. Um, I'm going to, I toasted the coconut by putting it in the oven. It's going to go in the oven at 350 for somewhere between 5 to 12 minutes. And that's going to depend a little bit on what the temperature of the coconut was, whether or not it's sweetened. Uh, so there's a variety of things that may impact exactly how long it needs to be in there. You just need to keep an eye on it because it is going to go from nice and lovely, just starting to turn golden brown to burnt fairly quickly, just like nuts do. We're going to sprinkle a little bit of that. It also, when it's toasted, it gets nice and crunchy. That's the reason I like to sprinkle it on the top as opposed to mixing it in, where even if you toast it, you get those flavors, but it softens up. I hope you'll give this one a try. Again, this could be dessert or it could be a salad on the side. It's Ambrosia for Oklahoma Gardening. I'm Barbara Brown. We started broccoli and bok choy seeds in January at two different planting times and the resulting seedlings are in different stages of development. Some of them have already been transferred to their individual cups and others are waiting for uh, transplanting. And what we want to look for as our seedling grows, it's going to outgrow the space that's available in our trays. So they need to be moved to individual cups for growth. And if you look closely at the plants, uh, the indicator that the plant is ready is when they get their first uh, full set of true leaves. And so the leaves that we're looking at here are called cotyledons. Sometimes they're referred to as seed leaves because these are the leaves that come out with the embryo from inside of the seed. And they store all the energy for this young plant to grow. Now in the middle we see a different leaf. It has a different shape. That's the first true leaf of the plant. Um, and it's going to have the physical characteristics more common for that species. So as we see the plant develop and produce the first set of true leaves, it'll be time to transplant it from this crowded setting into individual cups. Now some plants transplant more readily than others. Our coal crops, the broccolis and cabbage and cauliflower transplant very well. Uh, but things like peppers and melons and eggplants don't transfer well at all. And so with those, we usually start by putting seeds directly in individual cups. And to thin those, we would cut out the weakest seedlings and leave the strongest. So this is in a different situation. This is in my row. But if I looked in here and I wanted to thin so that just this one plant was here, I would just simply cut its neighbors all the way down at the soil line. And the reason I'm cutting rather than pulling them out like that is because I don't want to disturb the roots of this young seedling. They're very sensitive. And so by pulling plants out and yanking them out, especially when the plants are so close and the roots are entwined, we could cause some damage. So for transplanting, we're going to use this little bit larger set of broccoli. We can ha see here are those cotyledons, a little bit larger now. Here is a true leaf and the next true leaf. And these are definitely ready for transplanting. Now they have very sensitive roots, so I want to scoop them out. And you could possibly find a small shovel or a scoop. But if you don't have a tool, just a simple plastic spoon will work. And what I want to do is scoop underneath the roots of this plant very carefully. And I don't want to provide support by pinching or holding onto the stem because it's very delicate and can be crushed. So if I need support from above, I'll just hold gently onto a leaf. Plants can replace leaves, but they can't replace their stems when they're this young. So scooping out underneath, I have the entire root ball, and I move it into one of my cell packs. And I created a little hole, but I might need to open that up some more and set that soil down in there. And then I'll bring some fresh soil in just to fill in around the top. Now, if you don't have cell packs like this, you can use any kind of uh, container, a, a foam cup or a plastic cup or even like a little yogurt container. But you just want to make sure that you poke holes in the bottom so that there's good drainage coming out. After you've transplanted all of your seedlings, we need to take good care of them for the next several weeks as they grow. Of course, we'll want to continue to maintain nice, even moisture. We can start fertilizing after we have about two sets of new leaves, the um, true leaves on the plant. 
but we want to use a very diluted fertilizer, somewhere between one quarter and one half of the recommended rate if you look on a liquid fertilizer bottle, and we can apply that about every other week. Um, once we're getting close to time to transplant out into the garden, we want to start hardening the plants off. So that'll be about a two week period. So watch the weather and when you're expecting to be able to put the plants outside, begin to harden them off slowly. Remember to also keep your seedlings well labeled. Move the labels with the seedlings and it's a good idea to keep individual varieties together in a tray rather than mix them up so that you're sure that you don't get your cultivars intermingled. Now our plants will be ready to move outside uh, when the weather warms or in the case of a cold season crop uh, coming up in around March but we want to harden those plants off. So watch the weather and be sure to plan ahead and start moving those plants outside for a few hours a day to harden them off for about a 10, to two, 10 day to two week period before you're ready to move them out in the garden permanently. Starting herbs from seed is a great way to increase the diversity of plant material available to you and also begin herbs at a low cost. Now with herbs we start in much the same way we do with any other plant, but it's important to carefully read either seed packets or catalog descriptions to know what are the specific requirements of your herbs. Some plants don't transplant very well. Borage, for example, it's much better to directly sow those seeds right into the garden because if you try to transplant them you'll disturb their roots and possibly cause the plant to die. Now other plants do great starting indoors and benefit from growing for several weeks in a nice controlled climate before we bring them outside. You'll find that information on the back of your seed packet and when it comes to indoor timing Usually you'll find wording that describes uh, the starting time for your seeds as the number of weeks before your average frost-free date. And that's to ensure this, the plants are in the proper stage of development when it's time to move them outside. So we want to begin with um, a container that's two to three inches deep filled with a well-drained uh, media. And if you have a container, um, you always want to make sure there's holes in it. If it's not designed specifically for seed starting, punch your own holes in. Now, depending on the type of herb we're growing, we're going to have different requirements when it comes to light and also the amount of time it takes to germinate. So the first thing I like to do when I'm growing my seeds is prepare some labels and also look at how long do these plants take to germinate. And some plants take a very long time. Uh, parsley and lavender, um, rosemary, the seeds can take weeks to germinate. And so it's a really good idea if you have a number of small containers to put different herbs in different containers. And that's because if you have a very fast germinating seed growing right next to one that takes two weeks, at some point, one of those two plants is gonna be in an unfavorable environment for, for development. So this way we, have, we can control the climate around that seed specifically for that plant. The next thing we want to consider is light exposure. Um, so for example, I have um, a lemon balm and a sage here. Uh, sage can be buried in trough. They need darkness for these seeds to germinate. So I just start them in a narrow little furrow that I've dug in the soil, spreading the seeds along there. And then I'll just very gently cover those seeds up with soil. And this provides the darkness that they need in order to germinate. But there's other plants, including the lemon balm um, and many others, that actually need light in order to germinate. And you might think of these as seeds that very easily fall to the ground from the plants in the garden and germinate in place. Um, they don't need to get covered. And so with these, we're going to spread them out on the soil surface. These are very fine seeds. And if you wish, you can just gently press them like that, which will help them come in contact with the soil. 
and the moisture in that soil, but we're not going to cover them so that they can be exposed to light. Now my lemon balm and my sage are each labeled, and I'll go ahead and cover those containers until they germinate. Now if you're a beginning herb gardener, you might start with some of the easier seeds to germinate. Um, chives, dill, basil, these are all very easy herbs to grow, great for the beginner. Just remember to keep your seeds covered, uh, which helps maintain a nice moist growing environment. Once uh, our seedlings emerge, we can take the covers off and just maintain a, a nice evenly moist soil. We'll be ready to transplant these herb seedlings into individual containers once they're about two to three inches tall and have their first several sets of true leaves. Here are some of the upcoming gardening activities around the state. Next week, Kim will be sowing seeds in the vegetable garden and pruning clematis. Turfgrass specialist Justin Moss will take a look at some blooming winter weeds and have information about pre-emergent treatment of warm season turf grass. Gardening season is here, so be sure and join us next week for more of the best TV you'll grow to love. For additional information, show notes, plant lists, recipes, and fact sheets, visit our website or contact your local Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service office. Segments from this episode, along with hundreds more from previous episodes, are available on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Oklahoma Gardening. Be sure to join our Facebook group for information on upcoming episodes and gardening events, photos, and discussions of gardening topics. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens. This outdoor television studio is made possible with the help of our generous underwriters, TLC Garden Centers, Southwood Landscape and Nursery, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society.